This is a production of WTVI PBS Charlotte. A sheriff's deputy is laid to rest following an accident involving a tractor trailer that should not have been on the highway. Plus, President Obama outlines his plan to spare nearly 5 million people in the U.S. illegally from deportation and bickering among county commissioners. Those stories and more coming up on this Off the Record. Good evening, I'm Jeff Rivenbark. Great to have you with us. My guests this week include Jenna Deary with WSOC TV, Steve Crump with WBTV News 3, Mark Garrison with WBTAM Radio, and B. Thompson with WBAV. It's great to have you all here this week. First up, this weekend, Sergeant Jeffrey Green with the Union County Sheriff's Office will be laid to rest. He died in a wreck Wednesday morning on Highway 74 involving a tractor trailer that was en route from the Port of Wilmington to Cherryville. The driver lost control of the semi truck and jackknife rolling on top of Green's vehicle. Now I know Jenna and Steve, both of you, uh, your stations have reported this week that uh, this, this truck should not have been on the highway in the first place. That's right. It the report that we were able to get yesterday showed that there were significant problems with parts of the brakes um, on that truck and had it been pulled over, it would have never been allowed to continue traveling on the road. Um, but from what investigators have said so far, they have not been able to pinpoint that as the exact cause of what happened in this wreck, but obviously a very dangerous situation for this tractor trailer to be driving on those highways. What actually happened, you had 20% of the brakes. Each particular axle has two brakes on it. And inciting the safety um, survey that they kind of do or they check off on the equipment, they found that the brakes were insufficient. Uh, the trooper that I interviewed basically said, we don't know if that would have caused the accident, but in great detail, what's even more amazing is there were 14 specific violations that they found as they went from stem to stern on that particular vehicle. Mm. Among them, and what, what stood out to me, you had, in addition to like the thin tread, ball tires, kinds of things, you had an accelerator, a gas pedal that was held together with a screwdriver. Wow. You know, that was pretty mm. amazing in that. <clears throat> Uh, the vehicle had been inspected back in September, uh, but at the same time, they're waiting to retrieve the information from the black box. They have a black box, much like planes have black boxes, but that will give you time, speed, conditions, braking distances. So once they download that information, they'll have more specifics as it relates to what was wrong with that vehicle. And there was another vehicle in the uh, area, a tanker that was carrying hazardous materials. So he my was thought, trying to avoid right. hitting mm -hmm. that tanker when he flipped over onto the deck. So had that happened, we could have had even more fatalities, potentially. You know, yeah. the thing that I think about when we're talking about trucks is for so long, North Carolina in particular, we've been a trucking capital. There were mm -hmm. so many trucking companies that came through here. Mm -hmm. When we first started seeing the double-decker you know, trailers, people con were concerned because we had so many trucks coming through this state, and how safe would it be? And you would think that we would have even more safety concerns or checkups. And you see the Highway Patrol has the, the, the ones who go out and they check and make sure that you're all right. You see them pull a truck over on the side of the motor road. Motor Carrier Division. The Motor Carrier Division, and they'll put them up on the weight and see if you are overloaded or whatever, if you're riding too low on your axles. But for every driver on major or even intermediate highways, there is concern because if you're an independent trucker, and you're not making as much money and you can't get everything checked. If you're a corporation with a lot of trucks and you're trying to watch your bottom line and everything's not getting checked, we as the public don't have access to that type of information until there's an accident. Well, the like other thing this. that's going to be interesting to tell is the federal records because the, the trucking company was based out of Wilmington. We don't know what's in their fleet. We don't know how many vehicles they particularly have. As, Jeff, as you mentioned, this was going from Wilmington to Cherryville. And there's that stretch right on 74, right, you know, which turns into Independence Boulevard, where the people who have businesses, they say that trucks speed through there all the time. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the do. question is, you know, did speed play a factor in this? And the flip side of this, uh, we ended up interviewing the former sheriff, Frank McGirt, who was the sheriff for many, many years in Union County. And mm -hmm. he said for the first time, in 171 years, you had an officer die in the line of duty. Mm. And I want to read one uh, statement, uh, and this is from Sheriff Eddie Cathy. He said, Jeff Green was a personal friend, a family man, and a valuable member of our Sheriff's Office family. Uh, his loss is a tragedy not only for his family and friends, but the citizens of Union County. 
and um, that service will be on Saturday. Um, you know, another concern too, and I think we were talking about this earlier, um, uh, you know, if you're texting driving, yet one more reason why you should not be doing that because there are so many uncertainties on the highway as it is already. So you're just complicating what potentially could happen and not to imply that that was at all a part of this accident. We don't know. But how many stories have all of us done about the person who said, I just looked down for a moment. Just for a second. Yeah. Just yeah. for a second. And you meant to hit the T and not the S. And in that second, and you looked back up and things were going wrong. So as you say, Jeff, we don't know that that was involved. But that's just another concern when you're on the highway mm -hmm. and you're trying to get from point A to point B. And you look at the person who is obviously texting and they don't want to look at you. I'm the person who's going to write your tag number down. <laughs> that would be well, me. Well, my dad always said that it's never you necessarily that you need to be worried about. I mean, you it's definitely need to make else. sure that you yeah. are a diligent driver, making sure that you are being safe and not texting would be one of them, keeping your eyes on the road. But it's also watching out for everybody else who's around you. And it's unfortunate that in this situation that we had a tractor trailer, you know, come in contact with a sheriff's vehicle that was in a turning well, lane yeah, and, and you know, that's what could I have played out think, so differently. Think about this, this, this poor uh, deputy's family, because you know, when you have a death in the family, you have sort of tortured thoughts anyway, yeah. sadly. And they're thinking about the fact that he was just sitting there in a turn lane, probably had his mind on who knows what, and all of a sudden, a truck turns over on top of you. That's uh, he didn't have a chance no. when you look at the pictures, and no. it was flattened, you know, much like uh, an aluminum can. It yeah. just was crushed. Uh, I did speak to his minister that afternoon, and one of the things that we found out about him, he was very active at the Lakeview Baptist Church, and even several years ago did mission work uh, mm -hmm. in Mississippi during Hurricane Katrina. You know, so mm -hmm. he had a life outside of law enforcement. And so certainly uh, we do remember his wife, April, and uh, his children, Nicole and Allison. Uh, mm. Certainly our thoughts and prayers out to the entire family mm. and the community as well. Another big topic this week uh, involves immigration. Folks are talking about it all over the country this weekend. Uh, President Obama's executive order granting temporary deportation relief to nearly 5 million people who are in the U.S. illegally. Now, interestingly enough, and I, I looked this uh, weekend or this week early, and I saw that North Carolina has the ninth largest population of undocumented workers in the nation. There are about 350,000 in North Carolina. So mm -hmm. what impact could this have on North Carolina? Well, potentially a lot. It was interesting. Yesterday I spent uh, some time at some Hispanic-owned businesses along Central Avenue, and they were, I mean, they were excited. Uh, one, one owner said, but I'm legal, he said, <laughs> he said to me in the interview. But he readily admitted he had a lot of friends who are illegal, he said they were all very excited about the prospect. On the other hand, uh, there's a lot of concern among others in the Hispanic community that what the president is offering will not be accepted because you still have to come forward and put your name on a list and say, yes, I'm illegal, then you would be allowed to stay. But there's a lot of mistrust of government and uh, there's, there's some speculation that a lot of them will just prefer to stay in the shadows rather than put their name on a list. Out of the shadows is the phrase that the president used right. in that address. You know, but I think you kind of look at this from all sides <clears throat> because who does it benefit? Who does it scare away? You know, uh, what happens as it relates to the fight on Capitol Hill? So, you know, this is just the beginning of what's going to oh, probably yeah. be a very long dialogue. Mm -hmm. My take on this, and from what I have heard, stories I've done, people who have called me, while this is some approach to dealing with immigration issues, the rank and file do not pay attention to who's going to pick the apples, who's going to get the crops out. If we don't have someone who does it at a lower cost, then the cost for food and everything else goes up for everybody. What I hear from people is this, okay, I don't mind anybody being in this country, but do it legally. Don't do it illegally. What happens when our cost goes up for having English as a second language teachers? When the school system says we need more money because we have more children and these children are coming from households where they don't speak English. What happens when social service workers call and say, come and see who's sitting in the office. It's not, they used to be on black folks all the time about you're having all these babies and then you're getting all this money for social services. It's not African-Americans sitting there. It's not whites in America sitting there. 
it's more immigrants who are sitting there. And what the workers are saying is this, our cost is going up. So when you get ready to look at taxes or your county commission or your city council says, we need a tax increase because this department needs more money. These individual rank and file people are saying, how much is my cost going to go up by saying five million, you can stay here even though you came illegally. Their bottom line is, I don't mind anybody bettering their situation in life, but do it legally. Please. But be the point though that you deal with here is it's, it's, it's the game and the cycle, which is if you have more babies, the government's gonna give you a bigger check. Of course, month. and that's what they were calling and saying to me, and I'll give you an example. I talked to a doctor who said this young lady would come into a clinic and each month she'd say, am I pregnant? And the doctor would look at her and say, no, you're not pregnant. Am I pregnant? No, you're not pregnant. Finally comes in, hmm. they tell her, you're pregnant. She didn't come back anymore for prenatal care or anything else. But she just then wanted the money. She needed to know, am I pregnant? And she was young enough. Since that time, she's had two more babies. And let me guess, she shows each, up at the ER to do the delivery. To do the delivery. Which costs more, more. on right. the back end. And there's no insurance that's there because if you're not here legally, then how do you get the insurance or even get into the Affordable Care Act and sign up for anything? So I think the bigger issue is while they're playing politics in Washington, there are people who are on the ground looking in their neighborhoods and saying, how much more is this going to cost me? Right. Which and we that's know what city we got to leaders look at. and county leaders are trying to address that right now. I've been at several task force meetings that the city has been holding for the immigration integration task force where they've pulled together a lot of resources from CMS, from the healthcare system, from DSS within the county. And they're trying to address these questions because they see this as a problem. Comments have been made as, you know, this is here now. Mm -hmm. We can't think about this anymore as what are we going to do in the future? We have to deal with what's happening in the present. They're having a lot of students that are coming in through the doors at different schools within CMS. They don't know the language. They're having to try to break through those barriers in order to help them while they're here. The court systems are being inundated with children mm -hmm. who are coming here without any supervision and just trying to seek asylum in the United States. So it's a huge issue that Charlotte is going to have to address in figuring out, just as you said, how to address the care and the needs for these folks while they are here and trying to figure out I think for a lot of Americans also it's the case of the world knows America will not turn a child down. Mm -hmm. We will take care of children. The world knows we have a Madonna concept in our heads. We don't separate mothers and children. So if a young lady says, if I have one baby, I got one finger in, if I have two, if I got three, if I got four, I got five, they'll never separate me from my children. But on this end of it, as an American citizen, you have to start asking the question, when do you say no? In the world, there are only two countries that say if you have the baby in this country, your baby is a citizen of this country. That's the United States. How many more countries in the world? If I go to France, even though there are no eggs left in the basket, but if I go to France <laughs> and have a child. Thank you for that clarification. Of course. My child would still be American. It would not be a French citizen. Why does America not say that? And, and I understand from the very beginning with uh, slavery, and trying to make sure through the 14th Amendment and others that if you are in this country and your ancestors have been in mm -hmm. this country and helped to build this country, then you have a right to be a citizen of this country. But if you use the largesse of America to say, I'll send my child first, and then you send me money and then I'll come, and since you're there and a citizen, then maybe I can send. But I, I think the bottom line of this order is, um, e even if Congress tries to do something, which there's not a lot that they can do about it, and even if a lot of people don't come out of the shadows and sign up, I think what you will, ha I think the net effect of this will basically be a freeze on a lot of deportation efforts, so that the de facto result of it is, more of them will stay here comfortably and feel like they're not going to be sent back. But the other thing is, as it relates to the fight on Capitol Hill, I mean, what are the other people offering? We heard, you know, what the president decided to offer last night. So the question is, what are the critics offering other than criticism? And to that point, I want to read um, a quote. Representative Robert Pittenger is quoted as saying, it's an affront to the American people. The American people made a clear, a clear indication during the last election that they want us to work together. The president has decided to work independently. Has he? What's Pittenger got? 
Thank you. I'm getting ready to agree with you, Steve. If you're not going to come up with a solution, stop saying no to any options that somebody else well, comes up with. Well, what the Republicans said. think they have, because uh, I talked to Pittenger this week, and it's actually the same talking point that all the Republicans have. What they think they have is sort of what you were saying a minute ago, that the American people are getting fed up with how much is this costing us? Should you be here? They feel like that the last election was in part a referendum on immigration and on some of the concerns. So what they feel like is that they have public sentiment against what the president has done. But, but what's the, the reality is it doesn't matter if they have that public sentiment. They're going to have to do, do something, something in right. Congress. What, what is the message they're going to craft rather than throwing tomatoes at you know 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue? Well, for now, that's all they're going to do. Well, what it says to me also is if you thought we weren't in political gridlock before, we truly are now. Oh, yeah. And that Republicans may decide we're not going to do anything and just let him dangle in the wind. Hold up his appointments. Hold yeah. up any appointments he has. Which includes and the uh, uh, the Greensboro uh, resident um, who's up for the uh, Eric Holder job. Yeah. You know, from uh, North Carolina. So. Uh, well, another big topic this week. There's been lots of reports <coughs> this week about the bickering among Mecklenburg County <laughs> Commissioner. Uh, reports this week about a commissioner writing on his Facebook page describing a fellow commissioner as snitch and that she can't be trusted. Tuesday night was the current commission's last meeting before a new one is seated December 1st. And Jen, I know that you were reporting on this uh, earlier this week. Um, commissioner Velma Leak blasted an unnamed commissioner for refusing to work with another commissioner to this outgoing commissioner Karen Bentley, uh, she shook her head, looked at Leek and mouthed no class. Uh, do we need to call him Ms. Manners? Well, you know, we're two weeks after the election and still the antics that we've seen all year and pretty much through the entire uh, tenure of this class of 2012 Board of County Commission continues. Um, we continue to see a lot of infighting happening. You go on a Tuesday night, you know you're going to be there for a long time because there's just a lot of grandstanding. There's a lot of um, blasting one another while they are there at the dais and in front of public cameras. And, you know, the real concern is, is how does this make Mecklenburg County look when you have outsiders, developers who are wanting to come in and do business here, and they are seeing these county leaders who are supposed to maintain some sort of um, decorum is what you would hope that they would have, but instead they are going down to the level of name calling. Um, they are taking their platform in order to kind of condemn one another for a behavior that they don't necessarily agree with. And you kind of wonder if their message of what maybe they're trying to do at the county level may be getting lost in these antics that some could say uh, yeah, are well, childish. I, yeah, I, I mean, this is fun to watch if you're a reporter. I mean, you have to, to say, yeah. I, you know, yeah. George Dunlap calling uh, uh, Pat, Pat Cotham, Cotham. Pat thank Cotham. you, senior moment there, uh, calling Pat Cotham a snitch. So I, I got Dunlap on the phone, which is rare, and he agreed to do an interview, though he ultimately hung up on me. But he said, well, she is a snitch. And I said, well, why? And he said, because she talked to Channel 9 about uh, an investigation she was supposed to keep her mouth shut about. Well, then I called Pat Cotham, and she goes, no, I talked to Channel 9 after it was made public. and uh, Which the, is the, true. I had done that, that story it, that night. You did the story. And I had called her. There were The documents were made public at that point concerning it was the story was there was a Mecklenburg County DSS worker that had been charged. That's right. Um, with selling information of children. And so I was calling around to different commissioners, and I did get, DeMont Clark had told me we can't talk no, about he it. Won't it's talk sensitive. About it's an investigation. He's worthless. And which, I, which we understand <laughs> a lot of times. Um, well, I won't go as far as that. But, but oh, she boy. was the I only will. one who would kind of talk about just the reaction to it. Understanding, and I even made it clear in my report, they could not talk about details. Right. However, as a commissioner, what do you think about this? How do you think this makes you look? And it was public record at that point. Yes. But Dunlap is saying, no, it wasn't. So what you have here is Dunlap throwing rocks at Pat Cotham just because he doesn't like her. Well, but why doesn't he like you know her? What? Well, that goes way back to, to the Harry whole Harry Jones. Jones Harry issue. Jones, that's, that's so, exactly what but happened. The, but the, the compelling part of this politically that's fun to watch is it's Democrats eating Democrats. It's mm -hmm. not Democrats going after Republicans. And if you remember uh, when she lost the chairmanship, Bill James, who has to put race into everything, he'd put mm -hmm. race into a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you know. But the point is, he says, oh, now you have an arm of the 
black Democratic Party <laughs> taking on the white Democratic Party. <laughs> you know, and he's saying this in the dais. Yeah. You know, and he's like the you know the the, the Republican who's like George Goble at the end of the thing. You know, where he just kind of well, let me tell you something. Sits there. You know? What we've seen in recent years is politicians who have gotten their own brand of media training to make sure they get a sound bite on the air. And yep. what it is is a disservice to the public. I don't want to see you grandstanding. I don't want you to be able to use that to help you get reelected with your party saying, see, I'll say what I've what got to say it. and I'll put them on the line. It's name and, recognition. And it is. But you, you know, get that from doing this and it does us, the public, a disservice. Well, talk about media training. Now, Pat Cotham told me the other day, she said, when I was first elected, I was in a room with uh, Democratic commissioners, and she said they looked at me and told me flat out, do not talk to the media. And she said I was horrified by that. And w back to my comment about Dumont Clark being worthless, what I mean by that is he's worthless as a soundbite and as a source of information, and yet he is an elected... He's the vice chair. Yeah, and he won't give you anything, and th th that goes to that attitude that the Democratic commissioners seem to have, uh, uh, don't talk to the media. But here's the bigger question in all this, and that is it used to be where, you know, you go downtown, it was like Mayberry. I mean, everybody's very civil, very genteel. And when you look at what's <clears throat> occurred here, you got Cannon going to jail, you know, starting his prison sentence They're all this acting week. like Otis. Well, pretty much, you know, but you, you, you know, on the city side, you have corruption, and on the county side, you have, you know, dysfunction. This, exactly. <laughs> yes. So they can't get along. Dysfunction junction. Yeah. But you know, not getting the information that we need again is a disservice to the public the because you're supposed to be a public servant. We're not asking you to tell every detail, but there's information that you need to disseminate. It's the reason why years ago the media took politicians to task and said we need an open meetings law yep. that they can't go behind closed doors and make decisions our old buddy Mike Coza, you know. Mike Coza yeah. and uh, Bruce Bowers they and Ken yeah. Coons yeah. they fought for that that there needed to be disclosure and information that we could report without having to go through people's garbage cans or catch them when they don't expect us to That's right we can be civil but you have to be civil as a public servant now a lot of the fighting is over who will be the next chair so who do you think will be the next chair, Trevor Fuller? Or, yeah. or All Tom indications them. say, I mean, comments have been made, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. So, but it's Trevor broken. Fuller, it's bro <laughs> yeah. You are looking from the outside and you're thinking, yeah. this sure looks broken to me yeah. because you can't seem to come together and decide on anything as one body. It's constantly five to four. Um, and so all indications are that Trevor Fuller will still get to maintain that chairman seat because he has the five votes mm -hmm. with that body of Democrats. You know, with Pat Cotham as the outlier, Republicans will vote for her. She'll get four, and Dumont Clark will probably maintain the vice chair as well. Oh, boy. The next thing I want to talk about on a positive note, uh, the president is scheduled to award the Medal of Freedom to Charlotte native Charlie Sifford mm. this coming Monday night. Now, the Medal of Freedom uh, will be awarded to about 18 people, including broadcaster Tom Brokaw, actress Meryl Streep, Stevie Wonder, and Ethel Kennedy. And Steve, um, Charlie Sifford is, is a man who really changed PGA big time. Charlie Sifford is colorful. I mean, <laughs> if you've ever been around him and interviewed him, you know, he's 92 now, and I remember uh, about three years or so ago, they renamed Revolution Golf oh, Course mm -hmm. after Charlie Sifford. He started off as a caddy uh, at Charlotte Country Club in the 1930s when it was like, you know, segregated and the whole bit. And the thing about it is he was caddying 18 holes of golf for like 30 cents. Mm -hmm. And the story wow. he tells is he would give 15 cents to his mom and take the other 15 cents and go out and buy a cigar. And if you ever see Charlie <laughs> Sifford, he has a trademark cigar. Uh, 1961, he gets the uh, PGA card. He's the first African American to play professional golf. He was like described as the Jackie Robinson of the PGA. Six years later, he wins uh, the, um, the Hartford Open. Now you talk about prices changing as it relates to uh, uh, tournament prices. In 1967, and there was a headline I ran across that said from 35 cents to $20,000. Wow. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. One of the things I was reading this week, uh, it, it said that Sifford became the first black golfer to play in a PGA sanctioned event in the South, despite facing harassment and death threats. And mm. I think, I think a lot of times when we look at golf today and we see, um, you know, 
all ethnicities represented mm -hmm. on, you know, in the game. Uh, uh, we kind of forget about uh, this was just 40, 40 some years ago. Well, Tiger Woods even sent out a tweet, you know, embracing uh, the fact that Charlie Sifford is getting this White House recognition. Well, keep in mind, you know, there are golfers here, brothers who have been golfing for a long time, the brothers who have par busters out there on West Boulevard, oh, they yeah. have their club. Yep. And a lot of them and others, some folk I know over in Gaston County, along with Mr. Sifford, when people were caddying and the black men who were caddying didn't get a chance to play golf until the sun had gone down or the other white men were off the course and then they might get to hit it. So they honed their skills because they didn't have the best time or the best golf clubs mm. to play with, but they did it and they did it extremely well mm. and still do so. so well, and the amazing thing about Charlie, he's lived in some other places. Uh, the last few years, Cleveland, Ohio has been his home, but whenever he comes to town, he gets together with some of the fellows over the Park Busters, Busters right over on West Boulevard. Mm -hmm. so. And our friend at uh, Q City Metro, Glenn Birkins, wrote a really good article about this. And he said that um, Sifford had four personal goals. He wanted to be a professional golfer. He wanted to be a member of the PGA. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to win a tournament. And he wanted to play in the Masters. And he accomplished three of those goals, but never qualified for the Masters. And so. the, the amazing thing <laughs> with Tom Brokaw and that group, uh, you talk about his book, The Greatest Generation. Well, Charlie Sifford is a World War II veteran. Wow, mm -hmm. awesome. Congratulations, Charlie. Sifford. And that's it for this edition of Off the Record. Again, thanks to my guests this week, Jenna Deary with WSOC TV, Steve Crump with WBTV News 3, Mark Garrison with WBTAM Radio, and B. Thompson with WBAV. I'm Jeff Ryan Bark from all of us at WTVI. Thanks for watching your local PBS station. Have a happy Thanksgiving. A production of WTVI-PBS Charlotte.